Okay, we're good, George. Even though I know the words are just a filler, it's like putting a band-aid on a rushing river. It's just the way they hang and then seem to deliver. Opening a line to plow each furrow toward the tiller. Even though I know, even though I know, even though I know, even though I know the words are just a filler. Hello. My name is George Mario Angel Quintero. I come to you today from Medellin, Colombia. And this is Passion for Words from the At the Fringe Festival. Words seem to have accompanied me my entire life. There have been they've hung there in the offing as a sort of steadfast possibility, always. And um, sometimes they're just an ephemeral air, like what I just began with. A melody arrives and, and the words arrive to meet it. Other times, my encounter with words takes me to the area of revelation. And particularly at the beginning, my encounter with other people's words uh, opened important doors for me in my life in terms of understanding uh, in my limited way, uh, reality and what was around me. For example, even though it was 40 years ago, when I first read these following lines. Juan at April with his shore salt, the dracht of marsh hath persed to the rota, and bathed every vein in sweet liqueur, of which virtue engendered is the flour. Juan Zafirus ache with his sweet breath, in spirit hath in every hole and hath the tender acropis and the young son hath in the ram his half course it on and small full smacking melody that sleep in all the nicht with open ear so pricky them nature in here courages they long in folk to go on, on pilgrimages and palmers for to strike in strange strondes to fern hallways, couth in sundry londes. And specially from every sheer sender of England to Canterbury they wender, the holy blissful martyr for to seek that them hath holpen when that they were sick. This beautiful carillon of words, spring is brought forth and a whole universe is created. It was perhaps, you know, something I read 40 years ago and it remains a benchmark for what it is possible to do with words. Um, today, I'm going to explore some of the worlds I've insinuated in my own work in English. I'd like to begin with my dabblings in the world of the, of the folktale. Uh, I'll read two moments in an old woman's life. Uh, her name is Muriel Megrims, and she's tired of living. So first, we see Miriam, Muriel on the road digging up buckets full of worms. Mm. 
Muriel Megrims mustily mup mupping, mostly mumbling, rags making her way among the rim ruts mud, whirring the mucky rubbish with a white branch stump, each thump of her morning club pulled up with a suck. Muriel's mug red in the mist, murmurs rummaged mere scabbed blood. More bitter buds breach the branch bark, stun the trees siding the buckled road, stuck. After muscling up her bucket full of worms, she works her way toward a moistened crust envisaged, mouthing at it as her mind, that murk, winds along the road, pawing at the blurry image of a much further village. Gnawing on it still, the imagined bread, when she spots the tip of something poking its edge out of the broken brown mush and stops, rubbing the dull black bump of a bruise with her thumb. And the second moment we see Muriel's at the very end. Uh, and Muriel, as I said, is tired of living. And so she attempts to die by hurling herself at death. Here's a spoiler alert. Death refuses to comply. Her bucket and club drop. Sheets of blindness fall about death where it has stopped. Muriel is quiet at its brink, sniffs at it as if she were deflating. Then she lunges at it with all her strength and the branches of the trees burst forth with hyacinths as Muriel rushes to be expunged. The mist folds and bends about her, resists and blooms. As spray becomes sprig, it shifts its rigging, plays at being caught like two tent poles upon a taut rope as Muriel tips to a death, it tips away. Muriel gropes for it among ripening fruits that pendulate from branch grills, reaching through them as it slips from her. She struggles as Jasmine constellates about her ankles. What mad pursuit through pips and tendrils, earning fecundation with each green shunned footfill, tambrelation of each umble, ringing out at Muriel's elevation to where leaves winging define the vine reaches. Muriel lifts and in a cloud of orange blossoms loses sight of it. Larkspur shafts stiffly fill the rifts and her feet don't fall, though rafted on nothing at all. Crocus cups spill a shroud at most emboldened daffodils. The frilly fakes release their bees, buttering where death steps as it flees. Muriel does not stop to catch her breath or see how pleased they must be. She is already among the gusts of anemones, and still the sprouting won't give out. Or was it lemon trees and jonquils? The virtual verdure makes it hard to see. Muriel marigolds use death ahead and lilies, irisks making her illegible as the last of her vining on the page is covered by smilex and sage. Sometimes words seem to be holding or withholding the very nature of reality. Uh, here is an excerpt of a text where someone on a country walk finds his head flooded with words. Day will destroy the eyes of delight. Red will cut two leaf-veined lids from joy. New words will play and lack and undo. This last red stay will unhook away. 
Bright blooms return and spoke each rim's ray. They dim to stand burning a blind height, a dome where lipped light lifted to kiss. Blue incline, black distinct birds flew through. Employ the leaves to seed what was said. Sight was likewise spread and could not say. One of the ways in which words have functioned for me, both as a reader and a writer, is that they have given me, they have shown me the way to the threshold of epiphany time and again. Here we have the same country walker as before, <coughs> forgive me, and uh, he finds something revealed simply by seeing a crayfish in the shallows of a creek. Here he learns that such epiphanies are not always a lasting state. Light is pulled along the surface of the stream. It is single and insoluble, and as it skates is twined about rocks, splitting the water, carapace, or anger, attic, anguish, dear peace, cuticle and face, the blood beneath the light shone ordered, the armored crease, rocks and numbers line the bed of the stream, creviced sevens, curl gone beneath the lie of light, the lost in the pleasure of mysterious pulp, enumerate its flicker. My imaginings take shape in the soft mud and then recede shapeless. Next, uh, I now and again, I have a certain fascination for the playful structure of doggerel, doggerel verse. Here are two sad poems that console the reader by playing childish games while they deliver uh, their sad content. In the first, I use a character, Ignatz Maus, uh, from the classic comic, Crazy Cat. It began in 1913 and uh, ended in 1944. Ignatz is a character famous for throwing bricks and for being belligerent. I use him to talk about the horrible fate that befalls those who stand up and talk back in many parts of the world, and of course, in my own country, in Colombia. <laughs> Disappearance, tap dance. For combat, for a scrap, or just a smack of hazmat, from proletariat to plutocrat, Ignatz spat at a fat cat's spats. That's right. Ignatz spat at a fat cat's spats. At that, cats bring bats, and that gnat was shat flat, splat with a fence slap, a tat-tat scat on the hat of that rat of an Ignatz. Ignatz doormat's last gasp. And that was that. No bureaucrats, no dramatic acts, no taps, no stats, 
No ersatz facts. No looking back. No pitter pats. Just scrapped that rat. His stance that romanceless. Now I got ants. I got ants in my pants. I got I got ants. I got ants in my hands. Antsy. But no chance. No chance. No chance. The second the doggerel poem I'd like uh, to read is about a sensitive soul who ended his days too soon at 39 years of age by hurling himself into the waters of the Gulf of Mexico. In Hart Crane's house at the bottom of the sea, we sat politely drinking tea. We three, the drowned and I and he, and spoke of many things that buoyant men will never see. I could not rouse or upend myself or flee into the blue bends though the drowned excused himself, left early, had something to attend to, and left me with heart in all his sadness and his grief. Well, for survival's sake, if we didn't eat all his little cakes of seaweed and then stroll beneath the coral trees. When we returned, he played for me, every record at the bottom of the sea. I must have fallen down a well, along a tunnel, through a sleeve. And as I listened in Hart Crane's house at the bottom of the sea, the funnel of his Victrola became a shell for his belief. <clears throat> Now um, we get to something strange that, that occurred in, in my writing. And, and perhaps it has to do with the, the kind of role language and words have played in my life. But um, there's a certain kind of text uh, that I began to write at one time and occasionally um, slip into. And these are texts where the words seem to be pushing the text, the words themselves, where language follows sort of its own intuitive rules without heeding obvious coherence. Here, reality seems to be narrating itself. I'll just read a short example. Here would maple out the maps of jumping off the roof, the bundle in wrapper and sweeping high, faucet must tell how tin such the cage oranged from the ox hump upon the air down. Failure to fall appears beneath the skin in small patches. The trees are full of sticks. Sound in its stupidity is like a pocket knife. Along the pitched fence allows along the starlings turned and opened was a house with a light in its belly. Nettles rose around, something might, all this gathering going on, going around, still hearing the village send out its last threads, even here. 
touch, lift, touch, turn, breathing. The breach happened as behind the thin walls, a place, moon touch. With the harsh sound at its end is to rise in the monotonous light, is like a simple stitch is. There where people sitting at the table, killing could is, and wait had breathing. Touch to see moments pass and something happened, or the other, nothing, is reflected to know that people die in rooms, undistinguished by anything else. The sight of the wood floorboards, lamp, all this is how their faces looked when they shut the shutters. Lift is touch turning about a light could where lift means. Some carved picture remembers the air. They spent the afternoon gathering the sticks that had fallen. <clears throat> the next thing I'd like to read is a, a very early poem, actually. Um, it deals with uh, San Francisco, California, downtown. But as it was, uh, as it was more than 30 years ago. Um, sometimes verse has this sort of panoramic or landscape feel to it. And here's um, the territory around San Francisco's public library, where it used to be many years ago uh, in the Civic Center. The water heater box that is mentioned refers to a strategy that um, the homeless used uh, to counter the cold. They would use these uh, water heater boxes or refrigerator boxes because they were snug. And um, uh, they were these uh, cardboard boxes and they would hold in the body's heat. The library was a gathering place at that time for the mad, uh, for the wayward, or the bookish. There's a mention in, in the fragment I'm going to read of a wake and watchtower. Uh, these are the publications of the Jehovah's Witnesses, which uh, are often left in such public places and get scattered and, and thrown about, but which made very good uh, insulation during the cold months especially when stuffed into the collars of jackets or to fill in these uh, cardboard boxes I've been telling you about. So here we go. This is from a long poem called Nowadays. And as I say, it's about uh, San Francisco that used to exist. I fall in with a school of idiots that straggle along. Death is the moment of the greatest claustrophobia. We walk a ways until I fail to drift, to be a sealed breath, and I dispel in a closed street that falls away wrong. Always outskirts, further toward the center of town, down alleys of rest, everything repays by leaving quietly. The days lie on one another and they come up to my chest. A lot creates lots, vacant lots of unbought emptiness. Its occasional mounds of objects crumbled away from identity whose fragments show only still brandings. Rust forges over, originates, mourner and embracer of the passed over edges the shot through with corners, orange lessening in the field without voices. Open mouthed grass wedges its tongues between slabs cutting up in dingy tufts from dust glinting with glass burdens. Clump of jokes blown about between offenses and a dozing tractor it's pushing and pulling, wrung out of it by children with metal bars. I stand on a hill and look toward my home, the house of broken children. My skull, 
is a tipped over water heater box lined with a wake and watchtower before the library of mumbling. Stumbling the hours break on its brunette eye, sightless with belief, fathered by history and the stuffing ripped from expelled bus seats. No, they only bark their shins or recoil from the smell. Small relief or mystery offered by the wink of a soiled cap pulled over with a cinematic gesture. An abandoned man whispers a lesion to St. Francis. Uh, language and words have also had um, this, this possibility of edging over or, or transforming or, or, or deforming into vision. And, and visions um, uh, can be of many different types. I'd like to share a little piece of a, of a fever vision. Um, this, uh, this occurs in a moment where three travelers are walking across a bog, basically. There's a woman, her husband, and her brother. And um, they are three travelers who are unlucky enough to find themselves walking through an allegorical novella of mine uh, in which the main character perhaps is time itself as it evolves moment to moment. So this is from um, the novella Closer. I remember it is a discourse that has been affected by the fact that um, the narrator is suffering from fever as she, as she trudges along through the bog. Drops sounded, one, three, heavy, bulbs of water, looking around me for them. The sound was lost for a moment in a small wind that lifted to stagger about in tight circles. I felt a sudden burst on the back of my left hand. A cold splash caressed the limit of my cheek and chin. A curtain of falling touch, it widened away from punctuation and thickened out from popping to unite the rhythms that were back again into sheets whose edges were unhearable, and to dissolve the haze into an undulating luminescence, a coat that the cold that was now with us wore, a brief rain that brought confusion, all missteps trickling, rivulets running silver roots across the wide, puddling patina in seconds there around our feet, the difficulty of getting anywhere in so much reflection, how to find out a cross in so much falling we blinked through. We extended words between us, roots in the mud. What were we? The rutted surface began moving in the rain, live filigree wriggled out around our ankles like dark stems sprouting up and gasping for breath. Each slithering form ended in a gaping mouth. As we watched, the stretch of mud became a field of serpents. Ad looked up at the gray above us as if he thought they were falling with the rain. The line where the gray met the brown was alive with a greenish trembling, 
almost golden at moments, measured so that it was as if he were not moving. Tush began stomping a circle around us, trampling the serpents back into the soft mush or breaking them into dissolved bits beneath his feet. We were not surprised and his unhurried movements orbited our slow progress. How I became golden. In my head, a tiny painting that still buzzes. The crossed look of a fox, the smell of pollen, a squiggle in orange crayon framed by reflected light. Leafed light, not armored. Though we were walking fortresses crossing the mud, Tush and his encircling heart encrusted the ground with serpents as he laid foundation for our continuing. Ad and I, fragile and red at the center of his gray crushing, advanced and were mucked brown, coming at last to a shimmer. How, if we only balanced on stilts made of snakes, where does light leaf to lift? When does it become a covering? <clears throat> Forgive me. <clears throat> so that's one sort of vision. <clears throat> Occasionally, my writing has been susceptible to whimsical and capricious visions. <clears throat> this, is, um, this is a moment after midnight where a couple that have been wandering near a lake suddenly find themselves in a cow pasture. <clears throat> and uh, they have the distinct impression that the cows are beginning to dance. And the cows, which are Guernsey cows, so they're black and white, seem to be dressed in formal wear <clears throat> and they seem to be dancing. And as the couple looks around, uh, disconcerted, but not unhappy, and the cows begin to dance, suddenly, the moon appears in this way. <clears throat> Take heart from me, I am the moon. The stars are far from me, I shine alone. You've grown so fond of me, in such a short expanse, you long to dance beneath my tender glow. Soon I will release you from this soft embrace and leave you saddened and astray at day's bright door. There's no time to resist it. Let my light undress this instant and caress your mingling touch. Though such tingling won't mean much soon, for tonight at least I am the moon. <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> we live we live in a time of talk of blah blah of noise reason imagination lucidity seems more and more difficult to come by um I have found this to be this worsening, this, this life out of focus 
and full of noise has 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 upset me uh, throughout throughout my life and and I feel that now i'm I'm fifty six years old and it's worse than it's really ever been. And so in this next poem, I sort of trap things that uh, I see floating by in this ever more cacophonous discourse of sort of tinny noise. And um, with these sort of shards of garbage, I try to put together something of a confession. <clears throat> My funniest mistake is that I took life personally. It opens transformed now from fluted water to a forest of indignity. It waits for me like the sunlight that ran on ahead, waiting for this soft oaf who has fallen onto his own paved past and scuffed his knees. But the world is not virtuous long enough to vindicate anyone's shame. All we can be sure of is the gallop. It has become too easy to say. It has become too easy to tell. It must be obvious to someone by now that we hardly ever get there, to it, that a dash, after all, a pause, a change in direction. Our only forward is to trip and fall. Everything else is passing. And yet the impulse is an infant full of noise, but without a hint of how almost it all was. Pretense vanished without a bow. Nowadays, that I would live to know when they were then, the time of the big lie, when sorrow knew no limits and victory and death were the same word. Would you believe she wove sandals from her own hair so he might continue walking? Though I suffer delusions of being nourished, I'm just a conduit, an elaborate hose, a falling, a means to a gravitational necessity. And two, there is the death in bitterness, the death in sick and tired. Enough. Enough, enough, enough many steps ago. Just shut up a minute. Long enough to miss a fall. Long enough for the loss of fuck off to dissipate in the silence. And still, humiliation insists I dance with her. I am sure somehow, I am sure like a chord sounding out, and that is all. I was made for song, that I didn't make it though, seems more obvious than irrelevant. I was not made for battles, for definitive endings. When my body dies, it may well take my spirit with it, but it will go, my spirit, like a laughing boy atop a tumbling pachyderm. <clears throat> I'd like to read uh, one more piece. Um, it's rather, it's a little long. Um, 
it's a piece that was conceived for and at St. Andrews, Scotland for the Stanza uh, Poetry Festival last year in uh, March of 2019. Uh, it's perhaps, it's the last uh, use that I'll, for language, for words that I'll share with you today. And um, it, it is an, an important use, I think. Um, it's from a book that I wrote for this occasion called In This Cold's Tending Time. And um, the stanza of Poetry Festival takes place in March. So the climate and the weather in St. Andrews, Scotland is still not free from that biting winter that it goes through. And at the time, um, I was afraid that winter would never end. And so while we were still in the cold, the idea was, this was part of a collaborative piece with a, with a choreographer, um, Luke Pell, and uh, performance artist, Lucy Cash, performance and film artist. And uh, so we decided that we were going to try to prepare everything to be good gardeners and leave the soil ready for spring. And, and so in this cold tending time is about how to be present even when it's winter and how to try to have faith that spring is indeed coming. So um, this final um, use of, uh, of language, of words, is a kind of summoning. It's, a, it's an attempt to summon forth spring. So here it is. Roots have knelt, immersing, bent humble, in inevitable extension, in unseen continuing, to situate, to ford the current of weight, pressing as it passes, burdening under, holding down the hand of reach, bird with filaments at knuckle and tip, Burrowing, now no longer burlapped, but burst, shining down darker to grasp wet nourishment. How to prepare an arm to bloom. First, the hand must open to the coming green pulse, lightening down the crook light fire. Next, the sunwarding of each joint's gyre. Digit must twig and unclench. Limb must branch and unbend, forking forth multiple, knotted with buds toward nether transfoliations and flowerings. Mad cold days, rail against derailed ways, fail to say in time, wet and wilt assail, wind and howl and stay, flail extending, could shout, pray, would it then whisper flower, 
murmur forth its scatter, or hum to swell its weight beneath peel and rind. Pecked and gusted, cracked by chirping, burst finally by light. Slippery away, a clutch of cress catches bright mumbled guts, nosps, dying, dead, damaged and disfigured, rigid from frigid to a right from phloem, a widget toward ignite. Horals of branches spun out from pine, spruce, fir. Pruning saws and pole loppers, anvil and hand amend, cut on the pull stroke. Rose and butterfly bush still drowsy when the bough breaks. Though twigs and stalks protrude unsheared, let light and air behind it thwart the canopy. Slip down the tangle, thread, stub, and bulge, reach buds and fruiting wood. Restore, limit the wound. Dig to loosen, thin out to open, let sturdy limbs branch refuge. A caress gone down to the marrow, dreams alight on the legs of sparrows. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to share this time with you. And I'd like to thank the At the Fringe Festival for having included me in, in its programming. Thank you so much, thank George, for your wonderful, wonderful contribution. It's been really rich. And this video will remain on YouTube for the duration of the festival. I'm sure more people will come and watch it. And I'm sure those who've been watching now will love to revisit it and, and, and watch it again. Thanks, and enjoy the rest of the festival, please.